Okay. Can everybody hear me in the back? As uh, Misty said, I'm Jim Butler with the Kansas Geological Survey. I'm head of the geohydrology section or the groundwater section of the survey. For those of you who don't know the survey, we're a research and service unit of the University of Camp of Kansas. So our offices, our headquarters are located on uh, campus in Lawrence on the west side of the campus there. We have no regulatory or policy making function. Our mission when you cut to the chase is to provide a sound scientific foundation for decision making on natural resources issues within the state of Kansas. And obviously one of our big natural resources is the High Plains Aquifer. And so the movie that we just saw was about California and it was not the most uplifting movie I've seen in a while. <laughs> so uh, I can't say that I am going to be incredibly uplifting here, but there are some aspects of what is going on here in Kansas that uh, give uh, one some hope, at least for the near term, for the next uh, 30, 40, 50 years. So let's launch into it. And I apologize, some of these slides are going to be cut off at the uh, top and bottom. We didn't get it quite sized right. So uh, if, if need be, I'll read the material that's uh, missing. So I think most folks here understand the High Plains Aquifer. It extends over eight states here in the central U.S. It, as, this, as is the Central Valley, the High Plains Aquifer is one of the largest and most important regional aquifers in the world in terms of the agricultural production that its waters support. And just as in the Central Valley, the world needs the agricultural production that is supported by the groundwater of the High Plains Aquifer. And the question is, uh, what does the future hold for this aquifer? Can we continue? that needed production, which the need for is just going to increase in the future with burgeoning populations, with dietary shifts across the globe. We've got some heavy lifting to be done. So we'll, what I'm going to try to do is give you a feeling for where things stand here with the aquifer in Kansas, which I've extracted here in the upper right. It's uh, the High Plains Aquifer extends over a third to half, the western third to half of the state. Now. We are use, we're heavily using this aquifer. Uh, over 70% of the, of the water used on a daily basis here in Kansas is groundwater from the High Plains Aquifer. When we just restrict our thinking to irrigation water, 95 or so percent of the irrigation water used annually in the state of Kansas is groundwater from the High Plains Aquifer. That's where things stand now. Now this heavy use, this intensive utilization of the aquifer is nothing new. It's been going on for decades. And as a result, a price has been paid in terms of aquifer conditions. And I just want to illustrate that price here. What I've got here is a map that shows the percent change in aquifer thickness since pre-development or since the onset of widespread pumping for irrigated agriculture, which typically we think of here in Kansas as late 40s, early 50s. Now on this map, bluish areas, I guess they kind of come bluish gray in this uh, light here, are areas of aquifer increase. All the other areas, or the other colors, are areas of aquifer decrease. And I should note that these blues in the western third of the state down here, uh, up here, these are areas that were very thin aquifer to begin with, and so they're not of practical importance. So when you look at this map, you can see there's two stories to tell about the High Plains aquifer in Kansas. In the western third of the state, you see the predominance of the red colors. The darkest reds here are areas where over 60% of the aquifer has been lost since the onset of widespread pumping for irrigated agriculture. And frankly, it's not coming back, okay? As we go east, you've got much, uh, you've got lots of yellowish and some blues here. Why, why do we have this difference? 
Well, I think most of y'all recognize that there's a big difference in annual precipitation as you go from east to west. For example, in Lawrence, uh, our annual precipitation is about 40 inches a year. Here in Salina, I think y'all are around 32 inches. But as you go out west, down here, southwest Kansas, border with Colorado, they're under 18 inches. So what we've got is a semi-arid uh, condition out here, so rainfall just can't do it in terms of providing the water that the crops need. We've got to supplement it with large amounts of groundwater. Whereas here in south central Kansas, we get a lot more rain, we don't have to utilize groundwater as heavily as we do to the west. Okay, so we've got large water level declines as a result of groundwater pumping in support of irrigated agriculture. That's unfortunate, but it's not the only price that's been paid. There's also what we could consider collateral damage with, to our streams and rivers in central and western Kansas. Because a lot of these waterways originally were groundwater fed streams. In other words, the water table in the aquifer was above the water level in the stream water flowed from the aquifer to the stream. Now with intensive pumping, with a drop in the water table, as a result, we reverse that uh, situation. We basically drain our streams and rivers. And so just to illustrate that, there's a map based on data with, from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. This is a map of the major perennial streams in Kansas. The upper one is as of 61, 1961. You can see at that point the Arkansas River uh, flowed basically across the entire state. This is 1994, here the lower one. And you can see the result of all the groundwater pumping. We've dried up those streams in the western uh, third of the state. And I've seen a more recent figure, uh, and it certainly has not improved. So on this red triangle here is a site that the Kansas Geological Survey has had along the Arkansas River just southeast of Larned. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that location, it's about 20 miles, I guess, southwest of, of Great Bend. And we've been there since 2001. So I'm going to show you a photo of the typical day since 2001 at that point on, on the Arkansas River Channel and we basically have a dry riverbed. Now the plants and the vegetation you see along the, the river channel, the riparian zone vegetation, and this area is doing well. There's, you've got your willows, you've got your cottonwoods, mulberries, They're, they send their roots down to the water table, they're phreatophytes, they can tap groundwater for the water supply, but as you go upstream, they drop off because the water table is just too deep. And I'll just try to, to have a little dose of humor here. Uh, the Arkansas River is one of three rivers in Kansas that is federally classified as navigable. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's now via the ATV route there. Uh, so, but it is a very depressing sight to see our major rivers in this sort of situation. But it's a product of the, the pumping of groundwater. So the title of my presentation was High Plains Aquifer Current Status and Future Prospects. And so here's the current status. On the left, we've seen large percent change in aquifer thickness and causing our streams to be, many of our streams are waterways in western Kansas to be uh, dried up. So the major focus of the remainder of this presentation is what does the future hold for this system? Okay, that's what I'd like to focus on here for the remainder of the presentation. But before I get there, let me give you some background so you kind of understand the water situation, the aquifer here in Kansas. So first let's go to the aquifer, High Plains Aquifer. Here in Kansas, we basically consider it, consider three kind of subcomponents of the aquifer. In the western third of the state, we have 
what, let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. The Ogallala Aquifer. And the whole High Plains Aquifer, I should note, is just basically the erosional debris coming off the Rockies. The Ogallala is older than the aquifers in south central Kansas. Uh, probably two to six million years is kind of the time frame when we think of the Ogallala. Then south of uh, Great Bend, south of the Great Bend of the Arkansas River, we have the Great Bend Prairie Aquifer. And then to its east, we have the Equus Bed Aquifer. Now, Great Bend Prairie, Equus Beds, younger material, basically ice age for maybe, I don't know, two and a half million to maybe a tad under 12,000 uh, years ago, uh, the age for those. Now, the Ogallala and the Great Bend Prairie, these aquifers, the groundwater use, I would say is over 95%, uh, if not 97, 98% for irrigated agriculture. Now, the Equus Beds has an important role in irrigated agriculture, but also provides water supply for the city of Wichita. So that's, there is a, a municipal aspect, water use uh, for Equus beds, but really for the Ogallala, Great Bend Prairie, uh, municipal and industrial use, very, very small. Okay, so that's the aquifer. The other, if we're gonna understand how, what the future holds for an aquifer, we need data on how it is responded to the development that has occurred. And this is where Kansas shines. My predecessors in the water resources community here in Kansas understood, they understood that if we're gonna make sound scientific foundation, sound scientific decisions based on sound scientific foundations, we have to have data. And here's where we're unlike California. California just hasn't done a very good job in collecting data about their aquifers. We, however, in Kansas have, and I just want to give you two data sets that are critically important. This is our annual water level measurement program. So every year, in the first week to 10 days of January, the Kansas Geological Survey, the Division of Water Resources of the Kansas Department of Ag, they go, they send out teams. We measure water levels in a network of approximately 1,400 wells in the High Plains Aquifer, and there's a website there that's been truncated, but I'll give you that at the end. Now, we do this in January because it's three to four months after cessation of irrigation pumping. Most of the wells in this network are irrigation wells, and so we can, they're not operating at this time. It's been three to four months since they've stopped operating, so that water le level measurement we take in January <clears throat> is relatively insensitive to year-to-year -year variations in the timing of the end of the irrigation season. So it's this data set, we've been doing this for decades, and so this is the data set. It gives us a good understanding of how the aquifer has changed over time in terms of its thickness, and this is the, ba the data set's the basis of those maps I showed earlier. Now, water level changes are just a response to a stress or an excitation, and that stress or excitation is groundwater pumping. And this is where Kansas truly shines. We are not just our nation's leaders, but I would bet that we are the world's leader in terms of data on, on water use. What I've got a map here is the, the wells with water rights in the state of Kansas. So each one of these red dots is a, a groundwater well with a right to uh, use the water. You can see how they're concentrated in the areas, the Equus Beds, Great Bend Prairie, and then this is the Ogallala uh, portion of the aquifer. In Kansas, every non-domestic pumping well has to have a totalizing flow meter that gives annual totals. You are, you're required to report that annually. It is subject to regulatory verification. The regulatory agency, the Division of Water Resources, has the legal authority to come on your land with a calibrated ultrasonic flow meter and attach it in the pipe next to your flow meter and you have to be within 6% of the value of that calibrated flow meter. 
And so that's an important step. It's just not having a flow meter, but having that regulatory oversight to make sure those flow meters are operating correctly. So we have an excellent uh, data set on how much we've stressed the aquifer, and we have an excellent data set on how the aquifer has responded to that stress. And that sets us apart from a state like California, which does not have this information. In fact, most states in the United States don't have this information. The USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, every five or six years, they do this, what do they call it, a farm and ranch irrigation survey. And as part of that, they determine what percent of wells in a state, of irrigation wells in a state, have flow meters. The national average in the last report, which was 2013, was 28%. Here in Kansas in 2013, we were 89%. And now, within the High Plains Aquifer, I would say we're more like 97 or 98%. So that's something we can take pride in. We got it right. And, uh, we are more progressive than California, a point that I often make with colleagues from California. Um, so anyway, the data. We are in good shape in terms of water quantity data here in Kansas. Groundwater management. And, and here in the United States, it's the state responsibility. And here in Kansas, the lead agency, the Division of Water Resources of the Kansas Department of uh, agriculture. And the chief of the Division of Water Resources, or DWR, is David Barfield, currently David Barfield. He's the chief engineer. And he makes the final call on water rights issues. And we are uh, a prior appropriation state, and I'll get to that here in uh, a few minutes. Now, here in Kansas, we have this lead agency, and it handles both surface and groundwater as an integrated whole. Not all of our neighbors do that. Our neighboring states, some have different agencies for surface water, different agency for groundwater. However, these are interconnected systems we need to consider as a whole. And so that's, I think we've done a nice job here in Kansas in that respect. Now, in the High Plains Aquifer, the Division of Water Resources is assisted by the five groundwater management districts we have in Kansas. And these management districts allow an injection of local input into the management of groundwater resources in their area. We've got five of them. They basically overlie uh, all of the High Plains Aquifer in the state. They can come up with new initiatives, new programs for their district, but it all has to be within the framework of Kansas water law, and it has to be approved by the state engineer. And uh, the line that's uh, truncated there is taxing authority. So they can raise money to fund their activities. So that's uh, the groundwater management districts. You've got the data. We've talked about uh, different portions of the aquifer. OK, let's focus on the Ogallala portion of the aquifer, the western third of the state, the part with all the reds. Obviously, if we do nothing, if we go into the future just with a business as usual attitude, just continue what we've been doing for decades, this is not going to end well, okay? There's just uh, no getting past that fact. And in some of these areas, the end is very near if we just continue as uh, business as usual. The bottom line is we need to reduce groundwater pumping just as they talked about in, uh, in California. So how do we do that? Well, in California, they basically said, let's continue to use the same amount of, put the same amount of water, but let's replace, let's just trade off. Instead of using groundwater, we'll get some surface water from the Sierras. Now, can we do that in Kansas? Well, you saw that map I showed earlier. There is no surface water to be had here in Kansas, in western Kansas. Now, you, many of you may have heard of this proposal to take water from the Missouri River in, in the far northeastern corner of Kansas 
and send it out to western Kansas, so, you know, 360 miles, up 1,600 uh, vertical feet, et cetera. Now, regardless of your thinking about that proposal, I think we can all agree on one issue, and that is that's not happening anytime soon. I mean, look out at these big water transfer projects across the world, whether it's the Arizona project or those in China. We're talking 50 to 60 years uh, to put these in place. So this is not, this large-scale water transfer is not going to be the near-term solution. I mean, think how long it's going to take to work through all the court cases from downstream states, from people, the eminent domain, you know, environmental, Indian reservations, you name it. Um, so that's when people ask me, what should my child go into? I say, water law. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. So anyway, um, replacement with surface water is not going to do it. We need to reduce the amount that we are pumping with groundwater and applying on the fields. So how can we do that? Well, one thought might be irrigation efficiency, application improvements. I mean, we have gotten, we've really made significant improvements in the efficiency of irrigation. And so the question is, can we use that as a means to reduce pumping? Can that lead to conservation? I mean, think about over the last 25 years, we've gone from flood irrigation to center pivots, like those shown in the film where they're shooting out the top, to the drop nozzles I've shown in this slide, and to now you can actually have mobile drip where you have lines on the ground surface, perforated lines which they're uh, moving around. Well, at the Kansas survey, we developed an approach to look at have we actually conserved water through these irrigation efficiency improvements that have been had since 96. And to cut to the chase, our analysis said no indication of that in the High Plains Aquifer in Kansas. Now, this was of no surprise to the natural resource economists that I talked with. They said, Butler, what the heck did you expect? This has been known for, by economists for at least 150 years, there's something called Jevons Paradox, where you, know, you say, okay, I'm going to make uh, resource use more efficient, uh, I'm not going to conserve. Uh, and actually, uh, in most cases, you use more. But here in Kansas, because of the water right upper bound, uh, we just haven't conserved. So that's not panning out for us. So another, I, another uh, approach we could use is the water rights system, the water law. In Kansas, we've got this prior appropriation doctrine, which they mentioned in the film. First in time, first in right. So the more, the earlier you got a right to use groundwater, the more senior your right is, that gives you a priority. So if somebody, you know, if a, a junior user cannot impair your use of the water. And impairment is now defined in an economic sense here in Kansas. If so, then you can, do, you can put into motion something called water rights administration, which is basically shutting down the junior rights holders. Now, although this is what the law says, this has not been implemented to any extent in the High Plains Aquifer. Because frankly, um, it's considered mighty unneighborly to go in and start shutting down your neighbors. This, there was a big court case here recently in Haskell County, which we played, uh, I guess, a role in because our analysis of this one area indicated, this is back in like 2011, I think, uh, indicated that that area would not make it out of the current decade with the continued water use that they had done, that they were doing. And that led, well, that was one of the factors that prompted uh, the senior most water right holder to go into court and uh, shut down, I think, five junior uh, water right holders. But he was, he was not a popular guy in the area, as you might imagine. 
So there just doesn't appear to be the stomach in terms of the, uh, the individual water right holders or the chief engineer here in Kansas to actually apply this approach. So we're running out of options. However, there is, there, there, there was a longtime manager of groundwater management district number four in northwest Kansas, uh, Wayne Bossert, and he decided to see if we, could, if we could go down a different path. And his efforts led to some new conservation options that I wanted to bring to your attention. And these are options to encourage conservation. He got these going and convinced the Brownback administration to move forward. And the first of these, which is the Local Enhanced Management Area, or LEMA, actually was uh, put in place in 2012. And then later, the Water Conservation Area idea. I'm going to focus on this Local Enhanced Management Area, but it's the same idea for both. Basically, we're talking about grassroots driven initiatives that, then, that are then supported by regulatory oversight. So in Alima, a group of irrigators in a certain geographic area get together and they say, hey, we want to reduce water use, say, by 20% to extend the lifespan of the aquifer for our kids and our grandkids. If the majority of irrigators in that area vote to do that, then everyone in the area has to play by those rules. And then the regulatory agency comes in and makes sure everyone's playing by the rules. And this is by monitoring uh, water use particularly, making sure all the meters are working as they should be and that folks are, are, are holding to the agreement. So this was just passed in 2012. The first of these was set up in 2013. In a 99 square mile area in uh, northwest Kansas, in western uh, Sheridan County, a little bit of eastern Thomas County there in northwest Kansas. This is called the Sheridan 6 Lima, Sheridan 6 Local Enhanced Management Area. Why did they get started? Well, here's a map. It's, the title is cut off here. This is pumping density, basically. And the warmer uh, colors are the greater the pumping. And you notice you've got this hot spot of pumping there in northwest Kansas. This map here is water level change from 96 to 2012. And they started this Lima in 2013. And you notice they have a hot spot in terms of water level declines there in this area in northwest Kansas. But you'll also see that these guys here in southwest Kansas, they're drawing down the aquifer much more. The guys in northwest Kansas, they were losing about two feet a year. And they're in southwest, they were much greater uh, annual drops in certain areas. However, southwest Kansas, they have a lot more aquifer to work with. You know, you're talking two and 300 feet in many of these areas, where in northwest Kansas, it was like 60 to 70 feet, and they're losing two feet a year. They could see the end was in sight. They had to do something. So again, this is one of these crisis situations and our response to it. So they started in 2013. And the big question is, one, did they conserve water? The big questions are, one, did they conserve water? Two, did that result in a diminishment of the decline rates? And three, were they able to make money doing it? And all three of those are critically important. So let's look at these, each one of those. So let's start off. My wife told me, she said, you've got to have a plot, a data plot for these folks, OK? <laughs> Otherwise, you, they won't consider you a scientist. Uh, so I've got my data plot here. Um, so this is the Sharon and Six Lima. On the left, uh, on the y-axis, is annual water use. And that's in <coughs> thousands of acre feet. For those of you not familiar with acre feet, I mean, it's basically uh, the volume of water represented by water one foot deep over an area of an acre. And uh, if you prefer to think of it in gallons, that's about 326,000 gallons is one acre foot. So we've got thousands of acre feet there on the y-axis. Here on the x is annual precipitation as measured by radar. And so this is 
the pre-Lima period. And one of the things we found in Kansas is that when we plot annual water use versus precipitation, it tends to plot as a straight line. And this is an approximate straight line. We're dealing with uh, real data here, so there's going to be noise. This is not a chemistry lab. Um, so this is the pre-Lima run-up. So now let's look at, let's put the Lima data, the period which is 2013 to 17, the first five years, I should say, they, they started in 2013 for a five-year period. Uh, it was successful. They renewed it for another five years. But I'm just looking at the first five years here. And you can see there was a dramatic drop in that relationship. And so for the similar climatic conditions, you just go from one of the lines uh, to the other uh, to calculate how much water was conserved. But clearly, for the same, you know, for 24 inches of water, uh, of uh, radar uh, precipitation, you can see there was a dramatic difference in terms of how much water uh, they were using uh, at that year. And also notice how much tighter that straight line is because people were paying much more attention to meters. They were using water more carefully and so it resulted in a much tighter relationship there. So how did they do? For similar climatic conditions, they reduced pumping by 30% over what the pre-Lima period for similar climatic conditions. However, we have to keep in mind that this period was a period, every year during this period was either an average precipitation year or wetter than average. We did not have any uh, drought years. So it's still an open question how they will do in terms of a drought, but they are certainly off to a very good start in terms of being able to reduce water use in average to wet conditions. And that water use reduction resulted in a 69% reduction in the water level decline rate. So their reductions had a big impact on those decline rates and greatly lengthens the lifespan of the aquifer in their area. Now the question is, did they make any money doing this? Well, Kansas State University has an ag economist, Bill Golden, who recently completed a study. Uh, in fact, there was a uh, press release about it last week. And his finding, when he looked at farmers, producers in the Lima area and producers in adjacent areas outside the Lima, his conclusion was that the producers in the Lima made at least just as much money as those outside. Now, the gross of monies were much different, but the net was what uh, everyone really wants to pay attention to uh, was the key. So they were able to do this by shifting some of their corn into sorghum, which is a less water-intensive crop, and they used their water on corn more carefully to give it only when the plants needed it. They had soil moisture sensors, so they adopted uh, the precision agricultural, uh, agriculture methods to use that water uh, very strategically. So they have shown that you can really get a large bang for your buck with water use reductions, and it is practically feasible. However, again, keep in mind, they have not experienced a drought. So that is uh, yet to be seen how they'll do there. Now, their success has led to an expansion of this Lima program. So in groundwater management district number four, that Sheridan Six Lima started in 13. Now in 18, they had a district-wide Lima. Now their goals were not as lofty that original Sheridan Six Lima, their goal was to reduce water by 20%, annual water use by 20. They achieve, achieved 30 so far, but maybe it'll actually end up being 20 when you bring in the drought conditions. But the district-wide Lima is more modest, but at least it's getting everybody on board. In West Central Kansas, GMD-1, they're uh, setting in place countywide. Lima's are under discussion, and this is going to be chopped off here, but in Groundwater Management District 5, 
There's a uh, lemma that's being considered for the Rattlesnake Creek area in response to the Quivira Wildlife Refuge uh, impairment situation. So I think we need this effort to continue to expand. If it does, and we move into Groundwater Management District 3, uh, which is a major player uh, in, uh, in terms of water use, I think we can have some optimism about the near future here. Now, we get asked a lot by folks who are planning these lemas. They ask us, how much do we need to reduce water use in order to significantly impact the decline rates? So in order to just give them a feel for that, uh, we developed some new approaches to looking at this question. And then we asked, um, we said, OK, the way we'll, we'll show this, display this, is the water use reduction that would lead to stable water levels in the aquifer in an aerial, aerially average sense uh, for the next few to several decades. And I'm just going to, and we're going to do it for each one of the groundwater management districts are going to be our averaging area. So these are the percent reductions in average annual pumping that need to be done in order to uh, get aerially averaged uh, stable water levels for the next few to several decades. Now, what that means, that aerial average means the most intensive portions of that aquifer, uh, most intensively pumped portions of the aquifer, the water level will still be declining. But in other less intensively uh, pumped areas, it will now start rising. So on uh, average, it will be uh, just stable. So I think those numbers are, when I talk to uh, irrigators in western Kansas, and of course it depends on the soil type, the crops, all this jazz, but many of them think that they can come close to meeting this challenge and uh, still be able to, to make money. And here in uh, south central Kansas, it's, it's much less arduous a route in terms of the uh, reductions required because of the more rainfall they get in, the, in this area. So when people ask me uh, what the future, oh, let me rephrase that, where things stand uh, with the High Plains Aquifer in Kansas, I guess uh, my response would be that uh, the hour is late. There's no question about it but all is not lost. We now have these management options in place that should be able to significantly extend the lifespan of this resource. Now, we're not talking about making this sustainable. Uh, that is still uh, a question that we're gonna have to be awful lucky in terms of the impacts of climate change, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna have to have some technology developments, et cetera, if we're actually gonna get to uh, sustainability in many of these areas, but I think we can significantly extend the lifespan of this aquifer for decades with these types of pumping reductions. And with that, I think I'll bring it to a close. Just some acknowledgments of funding both state and federal, and Kansas Geological Survey has a one-stop shop for information about the High Plains Aquifer, and that is our Kansas High Plains Aquifer Atlas. And I know what many of you are thinking right now. Say, Butler, I do not have a pen to write down that web address. No problem, because I have right here the highly coveted High Plains Aquifer Atlas refrigerator magnets. <laughs> OK. And I've also got some, uh, some reports, et cetera, if folks are interested. And with that, I'll bring it to a close. And I'll be happy to take any questions, I guess, if that's the format. Um, OK. My, my question is, uh, if we changed what they're growing, you said it worked once, you know, with uh, have to use less water. My thought is now the, with the marijuana kind of coming up, you know, I'm not the, the real stuff, you know, not the drug stuff, but yeah. the, the stuff used for ropes yeah. and, and different yeah. kinds yeah. of things, plus less use of water for corn with cattle, because it seems to me we could feed cattle something else 
Well, they're, they're working on that. They're working that on making easy. sorghum as yes. uh, increase the nutritional value of sorghum, et cetera. I mean, I think there's uh, potentially a lot to be gained by considering uh, other crops. But I can't speak to the marijuana question. I don't know the, the water requirements of uh, hemp or uh, such crops. Well, that's what it's called, hemp. I forgot yes. what it's called. Uh, but yeah, I think it's quite a bit less uh, for hemp water. It could very well be. I, I just. You know, that was kind of why it came to my mind. Yeah. That's that I do not know. And have they considered any other way of getting, uh, like, um, um, atmospheric water generators? I think that's going to be tough. Uh, we just don't, I mean, the humidity level in some of these areas, it just is not real high. I mean, no, that's, but it works 24 hours a day. It does, and, and it works really well in mountainous areas, like in Africa, they do that to harvest the, uh, basically harvest the fog, this sort of thing. They could yeah. do that in the San Francisco area. Uh, I think it'd be, I'm not sure it'd be cost efficient here in Kansas. I just did, wasn't sure when we're so close to the Mississippi River. No, I, 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 I don't, know, I don't think that's going to pan out for us. We could just, why don't we just take the water from the Mississippi? That's what I say. <laughs> Let's go. I have another question. Um, the California film talked about how because of the over pumping, it causes salinity in the aquifer. Is that a problem here? And why not or why? It, it's a problem in certain areas here. Um, there are some areas in the Great Bend Prairie Aquifer and the Equus Beds Aquifer where there's a naturally saline water, uh, naturally saline aquifer uh, close to the, the bottom of the High Plains Aquifer, heavy pumping by, uh, by pumps near the bottom of the High Plains Aquifer can draw that up. And just by natural forces, it's being drawn up. Uh, I had a slide which showed the wells with irrigation rights or water rights in the state. And if you had, uh, I should have pointed out, there were some blank spots where there were no wells kind of in the middle of the aquifer. Two of those were due to the natural upwelling of, of uh, salt water into the uh, High Plains Aquifer. But out west in um, the, high, uh, the Ogallala portion of the aquifer, um, that's not a big problem. Uh, we do have water quality problems uh, in Garden City area, especially in the, the portions of the aquifer northwest of Garden City or south of Garden City because the quality of the water that Colorado sends across the, the border to us is extremely low. And it's caused communities like Lakin, which is upstream of Garden City, to have to put in a reverse osmosis treatment plant because the uranium concentration in the water was above the EPA health limit. And uranium, you don't want to fool around with these types of uh, constituents if they get above the contaminant level. This is all just naturally concentrated because you've got the reservoirs in Colorado, you've got a lot of irrigation being done in Colorado, and so it just concentrates naturally produced solutes, or just from erosion of geologic units, that concentration just gets higher and higher, and then they dump it into Kansas. So that's a problem for us. I have a question here. Sure. Um, any impact or correlation about fracking using water versus um, sustainability or impacting the aquifer? Well, yeah, let's talk about fracking. I, I don't think it's a, a huge problem, but it's something we have to be uh, ever vigilant about. Mm -hmm. um, but just for some information, Kansas was the first to actually experiment with the fracking process. In 1947 in Grant County in southwest Kansas uh, was like the first fracked well. Um, but it's a vertical well. All these problems we're having with fracking, I would say, well, I mean, that's too broad a statement, but many of the problems we're having with fracking now is because they've gone from vertical wells where the, you might just have like 30 or 40 feet of, of pay zone, so to speak, to horizontal wells, which may have, 
you know, a mile or more of pay zone. Now in Kansas, uh, when you get a fluid from a petroleum well, um, I'm not sure if everybody realizes it, but uh, over 90% of that is salt water. And that's why you have all those tanks associated with the petroleum wells, because they separate out the salt water from the petroleum, and then they take that salt water and, well, at one point, they, you know, decades ago, they throw it on the land surface in these so-called evaporation pits where they just went out the bottom and polluted the aquifer. Uh, but then they inject it into deep uh, saline aquifers. And those, uh, the injection of this huge amount, huge volumes that are now being produced because of the horizontal wells uh, is probably the major reason for why we have this, res this uh, induced seismicity in the southern uh, Kansas and in uh, Oklahoma. So, I've got a question here. Just curious, you got the three main aquifers you're talking about. Do they share water? It looks like they're... Yeah, the water will flow from one to the other. Yes, it will. There's no, like, there's no, like, uh, impermeable wall separating them. Uh, it's a continuous, it's basically a continuous uh, aquifer uh, across the area. Why wouldn't it be considered one big aquifer? Different age, different age. Well, we do consider, we consider, at the Kansas Geological Survey, we consider as one big, we think of it as one large integrated system and call it the High Plains Aquifer. But many of you have heard of the Ogallala Aquifer. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I just wanted to differentiate it, just so they understood the equus beds, uh, these sorts of things. But we consider it's an integrated uh, unit. Are there questions in the back that I can't see? I've got one all the way in the back, final row. Uh, your slide with the 27 to 33 percent reduction, would, did that reflect um, adjusting pumping to, to equal the recharge? No, unfortunately, that doesn't. Uh, that would, we would like that to be the, the case but we don't think it does. Now we need more information uh, to really nail that down, but uh, I, I'm afraid that we'd have to reduce it more to, uh, to equal the recharge. That's at least our preliminary finding. When you get water level, when the water table drops, you drain the material. I mean, an aquifer is composed of basically sand, silts, gra gravels, clays, that the High Plains aquifer is. And as water drains through that, as the water table drops through that, uh, that material drains. But it takes a long time for that to be completely drained. So basically, we feel that those numbers are going to match the drainage volumes over the next few decades. Uh, but once that material is drained, then you're out of that, uh, that source of water. So did, so did they represent some sort of time frame for emptying the water? We're, we're thinking on the order of anywhere from three to five decades. Uh, and we could stabilize water levels for that period, and then the hope is we get lucky, we get some technological advancements, uh, precision <coughs> agriculture further develops, for example, crop genetics, and we don't get hammered too badly by climate change, uh, then perhaps we do have a chance of sustainability in some of the areas of western Kansas. I think we have a much better chance in south central Kansas around the, the, the uh, Great Bend Prairie and Equus beds aquifers, but the Ogallala uh, aquifer, it's, it's uh, yet to be seen. I, we're hopeful, but I have another question right through here. Yes. Uh, you were saying that surface water is not really a resource uh, for producers in the areas you were talking about. Um, I'm thinking about producers like there's a guy named Gabe Brown up in North Dakota uh, in the sustainable um, production circles. They're talking a lot about building topsoil, mimicking uh, ruminant patterns in nature uh, to really increase the water retention in soil. Do you have anything, uh, did, have you worked with farmers that are doing that in, in um, I have are not. You, are, 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 are you seeing resilience with farmers that are? I, I, think, I think if you do that, 
you do that, if you can increase the water retention uh, capabilities of the topsoil, I think that's going to be very beneficial. Do, do, and, do you feel that loss of topsoil is part of why uh, producers are increasingly, do you feel that if, if they implemented, uh, it's, it's harder to, it's easy to say that, but farmers obviously have a lot of challenges when it comes to mimicking ruminant patterns and that sort of thing, but do you feel that that has anything to act, to contribute to the water shortage? I don't think it contributes to necessarily to the, well, I think, for example, if you're growing corn on sand, there's not much retention capability in that sand. And if you could increase that, then you should be able to grow the corn with much less water. So in that case, in that situation, you could see how it, make a, it, it would make a real difference. But I don't have the uh, uh, expertise to really discuss the practical feasibility. A couple more questions. Okay, right there. Is there any national kind of uh, monitoring like the Ogallala aquifer, T. Boone Pickens and his, uh, some of his ranchers in the panhandle of Texas have this plan to run a big pipe down to Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, is there any national kind of thing to uh, well, this? well, that's yeah. Groundwater management, as I showed in the one state slide, is is currently a state responsibility. Um, I don't know what the status. I heard about that a few years ago. I'm not sure what the status of that project is. Fortunately, T. Boone is not as young as he used to be. So. Yeah, and it's Texas. I mean, they have the rule of capture. They can. They have a lot more flexibility uh, to uh, to really impact their aquifer in negative ways. Um, but that, that activity will not impact us in Kansas. Um, one of the key principles of groundwater hydrology is that groundwater moves extremely slowly. I mean, you think of it, an aquifer like the High Plains Aquifer, it's these piles of sediments that have been compacted because you've got a couple hundred feet or whatever above it. And so you've got these tiny little holes, pores, through which water is moving. The friction is very high, so you're just not uh, moving very fast. So they could do a heck of a lot of bad things in Texas. Um, but with groundwater moving a mile every one to three decades, that's not going to impact us here in Kansas for a heck of a long time, which is fortunate. Also, there's a big river. The Canadian River also cuts through it that helps us as well. One more question from someone who hasn't asked one. I taught, uh, I taught back in Garden City uh, from uh, left there in 1980 and uh, worked with the Soil Conservation Service. And it was my observation that there was a psychology in that area that, you know, you live a long way, you're really isolated. But one of the great benefits is all this wealth that's generated largely by water. And we'll just pump that sucker. They were talking about it back then, about cutting back, but nobody did. From your travels around western Kansas, do you sense, besides the Limas, is that attitude changing, or where do you think that is right now, overall western Kansas? I think that has uh, begun to change. I think southwest Kansas is still probably uh, the least receptive to, to some of these ideas. Um, in 17, uh, when we developed this approach for uh, uh, coming up with these percent reductions, uh, the governor, was, Brownback, was uh, very excited. And so we did uh, two press events, one in northwest Kansas and one in uh, the Garden City area. Um, I presented the results, and then the governor, the lieutenant governor, then, ex you know, we're, we're trying to get people to move forward with this, but... Uh, I'm not sure that that made a heck of a lot of difference. But over time, particularly as your water table drops and you begin to see, hey, I've only got 50 feet, 60 feet left, um, that really helps you focus and begin to think of uh, maybe something needs to be done. But along the border with Oklahoma, 
a high plains aquifer in some of those areas is over 300 feet thick. And some of those guys are thinking they've got uh, 100 plus years of, of aquifer, even more. So uh, kind of, it depends. I think north of Garden City, uh, there's a, the people are much more receptive uh, to these concepts. Okay. I'll, Sure. Uh, I'm curious about uh, what, what went on at Schilling Air Force Base with contamination pollution in regards to what's happening with the, the wells around Salina and would that, would that eventually make its way into the aquifer? No, that's a, uh, I mean, I, I'm aware of that. Now, we don't have any regulatory functions that would, that, uh, case was handled by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Um, I do have, I've, I've done a lot of work in, over the years with Geoprobe Systems, which is a, a good Salina company that I think has uh, helped out in the investigation of that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think uh, that's going to pose any threat to the High Plains Aquifer. I think it will uh, give problems for the local uh, folks. One final question. And then Right okay, there. I'll take it. Yes. Um, with respect to the thickness uh, data you have, has there been a, a decrease in the, I'll call it the recharge rate over uh, time or recently, maybe in the last couple of decades? Um, yeah, recharge rate. And how is that measured? Recharge is very difficult to measure. And, but I would say, if anything, a recharge has increased over time because the prairie grasses were highly efficient at using any water that fell uh, on them. They had the deep root patterns. They didn't let a heck of a lot get past them. Um, then we've come out and removed those. And so then we've over applied irrigation water. So we have what we call irrigation return flow. So additional water that was not picked up by the plants that then heads down toward the water table. So I would say it's increased over time, but as we become more efficient with our irrigation strategies, that irrigation return flow will then start decreasing. Um, and so I'm not uh, sure what the long-term um, result will be. But it, it recharge is very difficult to measure. We're trying to work on, on that. Uh, at the Kansas survey. One of the problems is it can change dramatically from here to here. Uh, just, you know, maybe there's some uh, root holes or something, a gopher holes where the water can zip down. Uh, well, over here there isn't. So we try to get an integrated, uh, a larger area estimate of recharge, and that's something we'll continue to work on. And with that, thank you.